is Dr. Chris Kelby giving a presentation called The Ethical Abortion. He has worked at the Craig Venter Institute and was a member of the team responsible for creating the world's first synthetic bacterial cell. He earned his Bachelor in Molecular and Cellular Biology at the University of Illinois. And his, he's earned his PhD in Cellular and Molecular Biology here at UW-Madison. Um, he has been working on questions about what life is for a while, so we feel he is definitely qualified to talk about this with you. Um, I'd like to welcome Chris Kelly. So uh, I want to first of all thank all of the amazing AHA, AHA officers who are putting on great events such as these, uh, especially Nicole, our president. And I also want to thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, so let's get right into it with a few disclaimers. So uh, just to begin with, I should say I'm unapologetically very pro-choice, so that'll become pretty evident uh, if you didn't know that already. But I feel like I should say that the atheist community, or AHA in general, don't have an official position about abortion. So if I ever say things that you don't agree with, um, that's okay. We welcome disagreement here. Um, my goals really for this talk are threefold. So I, I want to examine some of the most common arguments that come up during the abortion debate. Um, I want to encourage people to evaluate all of the moral questions at stake, and I want to have constructive conversations about this topic. And uh, I might be crazy, but I think it is possible to have amicable disagreements with people. I think that both sides have some valid arguments, and both sides have some poor arguments. Um, no matter what side of this debate you fall on, I think you should understand that there can be uh, sincere, serious, educated people who are just as thoughtful as you are, but have come to a different conclusion than you have. And also I think both sides are sometimes guilty of failing to communicate effectively with the other side and just failing to understand where their opponents are coming from and why they disagree, and what, what exactly they disagree about. Let me give you an example of that here. So, uh, here we've got a few pictures of things. Uh, sometimes I'll just refer, it to, refer to it as the thing, if I'm going to be general. But uh, here, there's you know, three different stages of human gestation. And I submit to you that there are relevant differences between these various things. But if you're talking about abortion, just generally speaking, it's not clear which stage of pregnancy you're talking about unless you use specific language. So here are some terms that are going to be useful for when you're having a discussion about abortion. So in the first or second week, you should use terms like zygote, blastocyst, morula. These are some of the scientific terms that I might use and you should use. Uh, in the first through eighth week or so, uh, in that stage, it's scientifically accurate to call that an embryo. And it's only after that, in the ninth week and beyond, that you can call it a fetus. So I mentioned that there's this problem of people failing to communicate. Uh, and here's, here's a good example of this. So have you ever heard someone from the pro-choice side refer to the thing as if it were just a clump of tissue? Or, on the other hand, have you heard people from the pro-life side talk about the thing as if it were an unborn child? So two very different terms. And I think the problem is that when pro-choice people use phrases like clump of tissue, what they're doing is talking about the thing at the left side of that screen, things like blastocysts. And I think pro-life people, when they talk about things in terms of unborn children, they tend to think about fetuses in the later uh, third trimester, for example. Uh, and here's an area where I think both sides could be a little bit more reasonable. So, uh, I can understand a zygote being called a clump of tissue. I mean, it's literally a, a ball of cells, so that seems to be an accurate use of that phrase.
But if you're a pro-choice person and you think a fetus is just a clump of tissue, well, if you're going to be that absurdly reductionist, then you are just a clump of tissue. <laughs> or, you know, what about the idea of the unborn child? Uh, you know, give the pro-life side some credit. I think a fetus in the third trimester, maybe at the 37th week, where it's just one cesarean section away from being a born child, uh, yeah, I think it is fair to say that that can be called an unborn child. But to call a zygote an unborn child would require redefining everything we know about the term child. So, if you accept that brief uh, line of reasoning, then the, uh, immediately you'll see that the most important question is, when does this transition occur from clump of tissue to unborn child? That seems to be sort of the central debate when we're talking about abortion. But actually, that might not matter at all. We might not need to make that distinction. And uh, here we're going to get into one uh, pro-choice argument, and it's really the strongest argument on the pro-choice side. Um, if you're familiar with this debate, you'll recognize that this comes from people like Judith Jarvis Thompson and also uh, Dr. David Boonin has used a version of this thought experiment. So here's a thought experiment, thought experiment for you. So let's say that I have a really serious blood disorder and due to this disease, I'm going to die very shortly. And unfortunately, I can't just go to the hospital for treatment because I have an extremely rare blood type. And uh, it's so rare that, in fact, the only person in the world who has the same blood type as me is you. So, you, individual audience members, pretend I'm talking directly at you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, here's the deal. You can save my life. Uh, all we have to do is, we're going to connect my circulatory system to yours. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to follow you around in a wheelchair. Don't mind me. Go about your daily business go to class, uh, and uh, actually, so only after about nine months or so, uh, I will have recovered enough so that we can uh, disconnect each other and then we can go our separate ways. I'll be cured and you don't have to worry about me anymore. So, uh, are there any volunteers for saving my life here? A few of you, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, that's good. So some of you might be, you know, super uh, altruistic people, and maybe you're willing to donate some of your time to save my life because you like me. All right, well, that's great. I'm glad that there maybe there are some people who do that. But I think uh, you'll see, you know, the, the analogy to abortion is pretty clear here. But, uh, so let's take the argument one step further. So, it, you know, it turns out that, you know, I'm going to die really soon, and I really don't want to die, and I really need your body. So, if you don't agree to do this treatment, I'm just going to kidnap you and we're going to go to the hospital, we're going to get connected. Uh, I really care about not dying, so I don't care if you don't want to do it. So, you know, even though my life is on the line here, and I need you in order to save my life, I don't think that there are many, very many people here who would argue that it's morally acceptable for me to force you to give up your body just to save my life. And the reason why you, you, no one would argue that is due to this uh, argument of bodily autonomy, is what it's called. And this is the idea that no one has the right to use your body without your consent, even if their life depends on it. Um, so, also let's recognize how powerful this argument is, because, uh, you know, in the abortion debate, there's some uncertainty about when that thing becomes a child, is it a person? But here in this thought experiment, it's clear that I'm already a person. Uh, there's no debating whether or not I am a fully grown human life. But the argument from bodily autonomy is so powerful because personhood is irrelevant to the debate. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, simply because no one can force you to use your, your body without your consent. But I think uh, you know, you're all smart people, so if you think about this thought experiment for a moment, you'll arrive at some of the most common pro-life objections to this thought experiment. So if we were to draw out a graph of what's going on, there would be, uh, in the case of pregnancy, let's say, there's you, and you have some sort of you know, consensual sex. Uh, it leads to a moment of conception, and now there's this creation of new life. 
So there's this direct causal chain of events. Uh, and then on the other hand, with my blood disorder, there's you, and then, well, there's just nothing bridging the gap. You know, it's just, I'm just, it sucks to be me, because I have this disease, but uh, it's not your fault that I'm stuck in this predicament. So as the pro-life argument goes, because of the fact that, you know, the woman had sex, she engaged in this activity, which she knew had the potential to create a life form, and that life form was, has the potential uh, to be uh, totally dependent on her to exist, then maybe that has some moral obligations associated with it. Uh, so, you know, we should be clear also, first of all, that this only applies to consensual sex, so set aside the case of rape. It doesn't clearly doesn't apply here. But, you know, in the latter case, uh, you had nothing to do with me having this disease, so it seems that there is no moral obligation there for you to save my life. You can do it if you want to, but you're not obligated to. So, is that a valid pro-life objection? Uh, it's an argument, but does it actually respond to the argument of bodily autonomy? Um, so, some people make the argument that when you have sex, because you know what the consequences could be, you are essentially giving tacit consent to, uh, towards the possibility of becoming pregnant. Some people just have that view of, of sex, is that you should only have it if you're going to be prepared to give consent. So it's sort of a, a de facto granting of permission to use your body every time you have sex uh, for the potential life form. But is that really a valid idea? Well, you know, what about the cases of when people use contraception, uh, which is actually, in the majority of cases when abortions do occur, the uh, man and the woman, uh, in a majority of cases, were using contraception. It might have failed or it might not have been used correctly, but the fact that they were using contraception in the first place seems to me to be a pretty clear indication that there was no consent. Contraception is the denial of consent to uh, have a child use your body. Um, not to mention the fact that the woman in this scenario wants to have an abortion, which is also clearly withdrawing consent uh, to use her body. So again, I think the uh, pro-life uh, rebuttal is legitimate. They have some points, but I don't think it really uh, counters this argument from bodily autonomy, which is really supreme in our society. And uh, I've got another thought experiment, which will really help to drive the point home about how important this right is. So, let's say that after the talk tonight, you are just going to go and get absolutely wasted, as we do. <laughs> and after you're really drunk, you decide you're going to drive home anyway. And, uh, you know, so you're, you're driving drunk, and also your phone's ringing, so you answer it and you start texting. And also, by the way, since you're so distracted, you're, you start speeding, and you're going 20 miles over the speed limit. And also, you forgot to uh, take your car into the shop earlier. You actually should have done some maintenance uh, a couple weeks ago, so... Also, your brakes don't work very well. <laughs> so, here is the... Oh, one, one more thing. So, and, you know, as you are engaging in this incredibly reckless form of driving, uh, you, you blow through a red light and you happen to strike me, you just run me over, um, I, you, know, you send me to the hospital, my body is completely jacked up, and once again we find ourselves in a scenario where I am on the brink of death, and I actually need to take some of your blood in order to survive, or maybe some of your organs, you know, something that got messed up when you ran over me. So, you know, here let's, let's take a look at the logical series of events that occurred. There was you who was <laughs> drunk driving and drunk driving texting and drunk driving speeding texting and also you had no brakes. So, in this scenario, there's just an absolute shitload of moral <laughs> obligations. Like, we cannot possibly think of a more uh, insane scenario that shows, uh, you know, beyond dispute uh, that you are responsible for the predicament that I'm in here. So, you know, in this scenario, you took actions which you knew were risky, and you knew ha had the potential to put the life of another person in jeopardy. Does that sound familiar? 
but even in this most extreme example, um, if I'm stuck in the hospital and I'm hurt because of this accident that you caused, I still don't have the right to use your body. The hospital would never dream of taking one measly pint of your blood, even if it was needed to save my life. Uh, because, you know, you still have the right of bodily autonomy. Uh, the hospital is not going to take anything from you without your consent. And just to really drive the point home, let's say that you died in this car accident. So even in this insane scenario, where you are now dead and you really don't need to use your body anymore, unless you sign the back of your driver's license to indicate that, uh, that you want to be an organ donor, so, or in other words, uh, you preemptively gave consent to the hospital to use your body in the case when you died, uh, unless you did that, we would still respect your right to bodily autonomy, even if you were dead. So, uh, Again, like, just, just take a look at how strong this idea of bodily autonomy is. We are really not willing to violate it ever, in any situations, even if you're a dead asshole. <laughs> so, here's a question for pro-life people. Why is it that the only time where we seem willing to violate this right to bodily autonomy is when we want to force women to bear children that they don't want, and that they often took precautions to prevent. I don't get it. So that is the argument of bodily autonomy. As I said, I think it's the strongest pro-choice argument around, and I don't think there is any good pro-life rebuttal to it. But to be fair, I, I think let's take a look at some of the most common pro-life arguments that are around. So when we you know, ask this central question about if there's any difference between these things, the pro-life perspective is clearly that no, there's not. So let's take a look at how they come to that conclusion. So here is a scientific case from the pro-life side. This comes from the Family Research Council. Uh, and here they have a series of uh, steps that lead towards their conclusion. So at the moment of conception, there's this new entity that is created. Uh, the zygote, and it has human DNA, so you know it's undeniably human. And uh, even the most earliest of embryos are alive because they fulfilled all of the requirements of life, like metabolism and growth and so on. And uh, this early embryo is undergoing this program of development, which, if uninterrupted, will proceed all the way through uh, birth and life. So, uh, scientifically, it's pretty clear the zygote is uh, distinctly a living, fully human being, and therefore abortion, which is the termination of that human life, is by definition a murder. Uh, so, on the face of it, it, this is not that illogical of an argument. There, you know, there's a lot of true statements here. So, if you were going to be confronted with this, uh, this line of reasoning, if you're a pro-choice person, how would you respond to this argument? So, I think the problem here is that people are playing semantic games with words, and they're misusing words, and uh, essentially conflating words which have two meanings, and uh, pretending that both words mean the same thing. So, for example, uh, an embryo is clearly alive, uh, in the sense that it has cell division, you know, DNA replication. So it is alive in the sense that uh, it's not an inorganic piece of matter. Uh, it's alive in the most trivial sense of the word, alive. But so are skin cells that you could grow in a test tube. Those two are alive in that same sense. But that to me seems to be different than the idea of a human life, which is uh, something of a, you know, an individual human being, like anyone, anyone here today. Uh, similarly, they use the term human. Um, so they'll talk about how the embryo has human DNA. So if you would go into that cell and sequence that genome, clearly it contains the human genome. So that embryo, or those cells, are, are all genetically human. They all belong to uh, you know, Homo sapiens, the species, but 
but that's not necessarily the same thing as a human being, uh, or in other words, a, a person. So it's really this question of personhood which is at stake here. So an embryo, as they talked about, has the potential to go through the process of becoming a person, so it's a potential person, but uh, that's arguably not the same thing as a fully grown, actual adult person. I think these words are all synonyms, and I think they misapply the left version of those terms uh, in order to make the point that uh, the right version of all those terms applies to an embryo. So the question to ask is, uh, does having the potential to be a person uh, make it as valuable as a person? So here is another pro-life perspective that we can consider. This one comes from the College Students for Life organization. So they believe that, uh, no, as a matter of fact, all human beings are deserving of full legal protection of, from the law. And they believe that that protection should begin at the moment of conception. So uh, in response to the question about potential personhood and personhood, they think that personhood begins right at the moment of conception. And they use this really common pro-life argument, which is called the SLED argument. Maybe you've heard it before. But the SLED is just an acronym, and it stands for Size, Level of Development, Environment, and Degree of Dependency. So they think that all of those terms do not determine your personhood. So their arguments, uh, you know, will, they'll sound a little bit like this. So, for example, when you were a toddler, you were shorter than you are today. So your size changed, but your moral value didn't change just because you grew taller. Or what about level of development? Well, when you were an adolescent, um, uh, you know, after that you went through puberty and you, your body went through a series of uh, developmental changes, but you're not more valuable today just because you're an adult now and you were a child then. Or, or what about uh, environment? So, you know, if I give a talk here versus if I give a talk in Chicago, me moving in space doesn't change my moral value. And similarly, uh, a fetus that traverses the birth canal doesn't change in its moral value. Um, so that is the sled argument. And it's, on the face of it, it's pretty convincing, I think. But here is a relevant analogy, which I think can shine some light on this argument. You know, what is the difference between an acorn and an oak tree? <coughs> if you were going to describe some of the relevant differences, uh, how would you start to describe them? You know, well, size, level of development, <laughs> environment, degree of dependency. I mean, what else is there? Like, what other factors couldn't possibly fit into those four large categories? So maybe those are relevant differences. If we're going to value the life of a tree, um, should we value the life of an acorn equally as much? I mean, it would be an exercise in insanity to try and apply rules about when and where you can cut down trees and apply them to acorns. It just doesn't make sense. Even though acorns maybe have value, and even though all oak trees were at one point acorns, Still, we can't treat these things as if they were the same. So, why is the SLED argument still so convincing to people? I think it's a good argument because uh, it's a clever bit of misdirection. So, in the SLED argument, they take two things which have relatively small differences, like how developed you were today versus how developed you were ten years ago, and they say that because you, your moral value had, did not change in the past 10 years, then those relatively small differences are not morally relevant. So then they, uh, they take that conclusion, and then they extrapolate it all the way back to the moment of conception, and argue that those things which were not morally relevant for, for a child and adult, uh, they say were still, are still not relevant for something like an embryo. But what, you know, what they failed to notice is that now, that the, now there are many, many orders of magnitude of difference. 
So differences which were trivial when comparing children and adults, like how developed they were, are uh, much more significant when you're comparing them to something like a blastocyst. So it's a clever bit of hand-waving, but if you ever encounter this sled argument, just remember the acorn. Okay, here's another pro-life perspective. This one uh, comes from the Catholic Church. So at the moment of conception, uh, a soul is created. So therefore, you know, a human being at any stage of life and in any condition has a body and a soul, and every human being with a body and a soul is a human person. Uh, so therefore, human life must be protected from the very moment of conception, because that's when uh, the soul enters the picture. Okay, that's a fine argument. But I have another thought experiment. Let's say that I am a mad scientist, and my scientific career is all about conducting experiments which are designed to test your ethical values. So I brought along a little visual aid. Uh, here is a test tube from my lab. So let's, take a, let's uh, take a zoom in on this and check out this test tube. And uh, inside of it are actually 10 uh, fertilized human embryos. So these are blastocysts in my test tube here. And uh, I'm, uh, let's just say for the sake of this argument that I'm a very skilled scientist in in vitro fertilization. And tomorrow I'm going to take all of these embryos and implant them into some women. And they're going to become very pregnant. And <laughs> these 10 embryos are going to become children. You know, it's going to be a very, uh, very successful pregnancy. I, let's just say I can guarantee that. So here's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to take this test tube, and in an act of brazen cannibalism, I'm going to drink the contents, okay? So all of these embryos, they're, you know, they're going to die. Or, I'm going to give you an option. I can do this, or I've got ten test subjects back at my hidden evil lair. And with the push of a button, I will terminate the lives of these 10 adult human test subjects. So I'm going to force you to make a choice between whether I'm going to consume these 10 embryos or I'm going to end the lives of these 10 human test subjects. Uh, so which one, which one would you rather choose? I know it's a, it's a real Sophie's choice here. <laughs> But I'm going to actually make it a bit easier for you. So let, let's say that the test tube has a hundred embryos in it. If you are a pro-life person, due to the argument of basic arithmetic, your pro-life beliefs dictate that you must now value the lives, uh, well, value the contents of this test tube more than the lives of all of my ten test subjects, because there's more human life here in my test tube. So, you know, this, is, uh, this little thought experiment is really a direct test about uh, what people claim to believe about the beginning of human life. And I think it, it should be pretty clear that uh, no one in their right mind would actually choose to save the contents of this test tube versus the lives of ten adult human beings. So there's only two possible explanations for what's going on here. Either our moral intuitions are wrong, which is possible. So, you know, you naturally, you have a gut feeling, which is that you should save the lives of 10 people versus 100 embryos. It's possible that our moral intuitions are just wrong sometimes. So maybe even though you feel that you should make that decision, maybe uh, it, it's wrong. But uh, the other explanation is that uh, the idea that a human blastocyst is morally equivalent to a fully grown adult human being, uh, maybe that argument is wrong, and maybe it's morally and logically completely indefensible. You know, I may be a damn dirty atheist, and I may have no morals, but I will submit to you that there is nothing in the universe which is so valuable that it could fit inside this test tube and be more morally valuable than the lives of all of the people in this room. That kind of silliness requires religion. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Here is another pro-life argument, which is actually a very good one. Uh, I've referred to it as the line problem. Uh, so let's say that we were going to make a graph of human gestation over time on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, we're going to call, uh, we're going to try to evaluate the moral value of a human life. So, you know, you pro-choice people think that something like a zygote is arguably not a person, but we all agree that something like a newborn baby clearly is a person. So, you know, here's the line problem. Where does this magical transition to personhood occur during human pregnancy? Uh, and the, the problem is that no matter where you draw the line, it's always going to feel really arbitrary. So, you know, let's say you, you, you're going to argue that personhood begins at the 24th week. So, you know, do you mean to tell me that at, at the 23rd week, in the sixth day, it's not a person, but then when the clock strikes midnight, suddenly, magically, it becomes a person? That, that doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Because clearly there's no fundamental changes that occur in the fetus or in the embryo at any time during development such that you could make, you could draw one abrupt line in the sand and say that it was not a person prior to that and then was a person after that. So the pro-life movement has an argument which is logically consistent and it says that the only way for us all to be sure that we don't accidentally end a human life is to draw this line at the moment of conception. That's the only way to be absolutely sure that we're protecting all human life. And that's a valuable goal to try and protect, protect human life. So, if you haven't already, you will someday encounter the line problem in the abortion debate. So you have to be prepared to have a good response to this. So, how would you respond to it? Here is another thought experiment or an analogy, which I think is really useful. It's the question of when did you become an adult? So the question of when adulthood begins is pretty important. So, you know, in, in our country we say it starts uh, when you turn 18. So when you're on your 18th birthday, suddenly you become an adult and you get to do all these fun adult stuff like smoking and gambling and watching porn. Um, and when you were 17, you couldn't do those things. Um, but, I mean, let's, let's be serious, though. Also, there are some really important questions that come along with uh, trying to figure out when adulthood begins. Uh, when you turn 18, now you can be tried as an adult in court. That is hugely important. Or, you know, what about the question of voting ages? That has some serious consequences, too. Uh, you know, in a democracy, voting is our most sacred right. So it's very important that we make sure that all of the people who should be able to vote have the right to vote. So when should people be able to vote? You know, when they're adults? Okay, but uh, what if we get that question wrong about when people become adults? And actually we did get that question wrong. The voting age used to be 21 up until we passed the 26th Amendment in the 1970s. So what if we're still wrong? What if we are systematically disenfranchising 17-year-olds who should be considered adults and should have the right to vote? Well, here's a proposal. Maybe the only way that we can be certain that we are not inadvertently denying voting rights to potential adults is to grant the right to vote at birth. It's the only way to be sure. Okay, so clearly that's a pretty silly argument. But, uh, you know, what is, what is this, what is this analogy illustrate? I think that although there's no clear line at which you become an adult. I think if you consider your own childhood, you'll see that it was more of a continuum of becoming an adult. There's this gradual progression of changes that you go through. So, you know, there's changes in your body, like puberty and your brain becoming more developed. And there's also societal changes, like you gain more responsibilities, such as driving a car for the first time, or getting your first job, having to pay bills. So, Gradually, over time, you're growing more mature, um, and we can take into account these kinds of milestones 
as your level of maturity grows. And uh, we can use those properties of you getting older to come to a reasonable conclusion about when you are adult enough to have certain responsibilities. So, you know, we encounter the lion problem all the time in our society with questions like when can you vote, when can you drink, when can you rent a car. Uh, and this is really exactly the same sort of case that we see in human gestation. So I think the solution to the line problem is to take sort of a calculus-based approach towards drawing many lines, not just one line, and recognize that the moral value of an embryo or a fetus uh, exists on a spectrum where it is slowly accumulating more and more moral value over time. And just as we can take into account milestones as you become an adult, we can take into account milestones during human development. And uh, you, know, you can consider many different ones, like you know, when certain organs are being developed, uh, maybe the moment of viability of the fetus, or when you can detect certain kinds of brain activity. These are all things that you can integrate into your ideas of the moral value of the human fetus or human embryo. So, you know, this is how I think people should consider the question of abortion. So, you know, here, here's an, uh, an important thing to think about, though. So, if you accept this argument that I'm presenting here, you'll notice that I claim that the fetus is gaining moral value over time. So, it would be a fair question to ask, um, you know, are there any certain late-term abortions which I think could be, become problematic or immoral or maybe even illegal? So, you know, now we're starting to get into the realm of politics. And if we're going to talk about politics, we have to live in the real world and consider real-world data. So here is some information from the Guttmacher Institute, a really valuable resource. You should check it out. And here is a chart of when abortions occur during human pregnancy. So you'll notice that 60, 62% occur in the first eight or nine weeks. So that is a, a stage where I would consider them not very morally problematic. And what about the third trimester, where it's a more developed fetus and maybe it's a tougher question? Well, it, you can't even see it on this chart, but it's you know, less than one-tenth of one percent of abortions occur in the third trimester. And when they do occur, they occur for very tragic reasons, like the life of the mother being at stake, for example. And in, in, in speaking about politics, you know, here's really the tragic thing about this graph, is that nearly half of women who get abortions, when they are consulted about it, um, they say that uh, the delays that they had in getting an abortion uh, were caused by things like not having access to a, an abortion provider, not having enough money, not having enough transportation. So if you think that some of these later second trimester or beyond abortions are problematic, well the problem is that women just can't get them early enough due to these societal uh, problems of getting the procedure done. So I want to conclude with some just common sense observations about the state of politics in our country right now. So, you know, we have one political party, the GOP, which has taken a very, uh, what I would consider, extreme approach towards dealing with the question of abortion. So they're doing things like forcing women's health clinics to close by defunding them or uh, enacting these trap laws. It's targeted regulation of abortion providers. Um, they're creating all of these artificial legislative hurdles like mandatory waiting periods and mandatory counseling. And they're also just trying to discourage women from getting abortions with completely unnecessary medical procedures like ultrasounds and even forcing physicians to read off state mandated scripts about abortion which often contain medically inaccurate information. So if we uh, accept my ideas, 
uh, you know, we'll see and we accept the idea that earlier abortions are less morally problematic, you'll see that all of these Republican strategies are just having the effect of delaying abortions in a lot of cases. And really the worst thing about that is that the longer you wait to get an abortion, the more dangerous it, it becomes. So earlier abortions are safer for women. Republican legislation makes it more dangerous for women to get an abortion by giving them, by forcing them to uh, have all of these uh, delays. Um, although I, I should make it clear that uh, abortions are much safer than giving birth anyway, so even though they become more dangerous the longer you wait, still safer than giving birth. Uh, so can we come to any common sense conclusion about what we should do to address the abortion problem? Well, maybe both sides can agree that unwanted pregnancies are an undesirable thing. So it seems that we would all be happy with this solution where we could try to prevent them from occurring in the first place. And uh, the way to do that is to give people access to legitimate, medically accurate sex education and to give them access to easy, uh, easy to access, affordable uh, uh, contraceptive methods particularly those methods which are long-term ones, like implants, you know, IUDs, uh, less prone to error. And if we were to take that strategy, uh, we would have the desired solution of having less unwanted pregnancies. And uh, I think it's a real shame that the GOP is going down a much different route. So with that, I'm just about out of time, but I'd be happy to hear some of your thoughts and any questions that you might have. Okay, so we have about like 15 minutes for questions. If anybody um, would like to pose one, if you could speak loud and clear, that would be excellent. Uh, yeah, in the tie. Um, I'd like to be a devil's advocate. Um, so what I want to ask you is, could you acknowledge other arguments against abortion that might make it questionable, if not something that should be prohibited, and that would be grounds for dissuading somebody from having individually an abortion? I'm thinking primarily of demographic arguments directed towards diversity. Uh, think, for instance, of the practice in China, where admittedly it's aggravated by the former one-child policy has just gotten away from it. But there is a practice, apparently, of favoring male embryos over female ones. And this could possibly occur in other contexts, too. Um, yeah, I think that's a fair question. So, I mean, it, I spend a lot of time reading and listening to pro-abortion, or, sorry, pro-life arguments, and uh, I think I'm presented a couple of them pretty fairly. I haven't encountered any other ones which I think are more convincing than the ones I talked about tonight. Um, you asked about if there were any scenarios where maybe someone could make the argument that abortion should be illegal. And I think that there are certainly cases where I would say abortions would be immoral like, I would personally not approve of them. And so, for example, an abortion due to sex selection, you know, that seems to me to be fairly immoral. But I'm still not really comfortable to support any kind of legislation that would seek to restrict the right of women to have an abortion. And the reason why I'm so hesitant to support any of those kinds of laws is that, you know, abortion is just such a complicated topic, and there are just so many different kinds of fringe cases where, you know, uh, you know, there's things like co coercion going on or, you know, genetic abnormalities, you know, all of these factors that could come into play, which are difficult to consider all possible scenarios when you're trying to draft a law. So I think it, it, it's just more sensible to leave it up to uh, women and their doctors in order to make responsible decisions about their own body. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry. Um, so I have a question. So 
Can you talk a, you talk a lot about like abortion in the first trimester when there's still a zygo or a clump of tissues? Then I guess my question is, what if someone, let's say, a woman gets abortion in the third trimester, two weeks or three weeks before the due date? Do you think that's just as ethical or unethical as having abortion, like in like very beginning of the first trimester? And how is that, for example, if you like in a very um, hypothetical situation, let's say you have the abortion a day or an hour before the baby's due, then how is that different from killing a baby after the baby's born when the baby's literally still coming to a mom? That's still the only difference seems like now the baby is outside the mom, but it's still connecting to the mom with the umbilical cord. If you kill the baby, then that would be considered illegal, I believe. So how is that different? And yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So <clears throat> this is what I'm talking about when at the beginning I said that uh, some people on both sides have ideas which are just too simplistic about you know the complicated topic of abortion. So you know one very common pro or pro choice sentiment is that you know it's her body, her choice, end of discussion. So you know that's a that's a valid argument. I think that argument brings a lot to the table. That's essentially the argument of bodily autonomy. But as you were just pointing out, if that's all there is to the debate, then it's still her body at the 38th week. So you know logically. If that's what you believe, that it's her body and it's her choice, you are logically bound to support that kind of abortion in the very, very late third, uh, third trimester. Uh, so, you know, I think that's why you have to bring in other pro choice arguments to support your case uh, where, you know, the argument of bodily autonomy is really not going so well in the third trimester. But also, you know, when we're talking about the question that you posed, uh, it's important to recognize the real world, which is why I included that slide. Uh, you know, again, less than one tenth of one percent of abortions do occur in the third trimester, and when they do occur, it's always for really tragic circumstances. So yeah, I know, like yeah. I know, like that's just a very hypothetical situation because I believe. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good hypothetical question. I mean, it's a good thought experiment to think about how we should react to that sort, sort of scenario. So, I mean, what, you know, one response to the thought experiment is that, well, you know, that, in fact, doesn't ever happen. So, that's one solution to it. But also, uh, like I said earlier, I'm just not comfortable uh, with any legislation that would say that that's, that should be illegal because there's just too many factors uh, that would that could come into that could come into play when you're trying to legislate certain kinds of abortion as illegal. But you know, I, I would have to agree though that if there was a woman who was getting just an elective abortion in the 39th week, I think that would be immoral. So I I think you know the pro-choice side should just admit that it's theoretically possible for a certain type of hypothetical abortion to be immoral. Of course, it doesn't actually happen ever. Yes. Um, I don't know a whole lot about like abortion, like, like how the procedure works at all. But I had read stuff where a doctor was performing a abortion and it something happened and, and the baby came out alive, but they are still required to terminate the child's life. Like I'm just wondering kind of like what your views are on that, considering like now it's not the mother's body anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I think the way that abortions are done uh, is typically that the ending of that life is done inside of the woman. I don't want to get too graphic, but uh, you know that's just the way that the procedure is done. I guess I don't really have anything to say about other cases which perhaps have happened. Uh, but I don't, I don't really think that it's morally relevant where, that end, where the ending of that life physically occurs. If an abortion is moral at a certain point, then it's going to be moral whether it happens inside or, or outside. Yes? Uh, 
two common positions seem to be pro-choice and uh, pro-life. I don't know if you looked at the pro-abortion position, where giving birth can be unethical, and there could be cir circumstances where a mother has an op a moral obligation to an abortion. Hmm. Uh, I guess I don't know too much about that movement. It's hard to imagine a scenario where a woman would be obligated to have an abortion. But I certainly am familiar with movements like antinatalism, which are just basically getting at the idea of human reproduction being a potentially immoral act. Uh, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Uh, yes, in the middle. Um, I'm glad you acknowledge the extremes the two-party system has led to. Uh, the GOP has an extreme position on this issue, the pandering to the base, of course. Um, but there is another party in America, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, it's the Democratic Party, and I'm just wondering what their stance is. Is it as extreme to the opposite end of the spectrum? Like, it's not a baby until it leaves the hospital? Or how, how extreme are they? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a fair question. So if I was going to imagine the hypothetical antipolar extreme of the GOP, it would be a party that is pro-abortions uh, all the time, or trying to encourage abortions occurring, or trying to force people to have abortions. Uh, it would be you know, that sort of an extreme position. But I don't think that the Democratic Party is doing anything extreme in this debate. They are mostly just scrambling to try and stem the tide of Republican legislation, which is being passed in dozens of states across the country. Uh, they're basically, the, the Democratic Party is just trying to maintain the status quo and trying to prevent more of these horrible laws from being passed. I don't think that's an extreme position. All right, back. Uh, thanks for the talk. I think it was just really helpful to hear all these things in a logical way. It's been really helpful. So I just wanted to thank you for the talk. Um, two, I was just curious, what's been the most difficult conversation you've had about this with someone who is very much opposed? Because these all make sense to me, these arguments. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I wish I had a good story about some sort of emotional confrontation uh, over this issue, but I thankfully I haven't encountered any of that. But wh what I have encountered is a lot of interactions with you know really thoughtful pro-life people, which is uh, you know why I try to give them a lot of credit uh, for certain arguments, and that's why I started the talk by saying that you know there are people who are just as smart as you, just as passionate about this issue as you are, but they've come to a different conclusion. Yeah, and I, I can say that because, you know, I've met those people. Uh, AHA has a really productive collaboration with the largest Catholic student group on campus, okay, Badger Catholic. So uh, if you think that, you know, there's no such thing as a logical pro-life person, you uh, owe it to yourself to go and talk to some of them uh, and just become more worldly and more educated about how people who don't agree with you think. Uh, you might be surprised. Yes. I'm curious about like uh, when uh, when the argument of like it's the woman's choice kind of like, gets foggy. Like in a case like if the woman didn't want the baby but the man did, like where you know it's like the morality in that, or or I guess in the other case, the man didn't want the baby but the woman did want the baby. So where? Is that line kind of across? Yeah, that one can be tricky at times. Uh, since you know both parties clearly played a role in the creation of that life, it's sort of tempting just to think that they should both have an equal say. But uh, you know we have to recognize that you know you know based on the argument of bodily autonomy that we had talked about, you know it's really the woman's body who which is going to have to deal with this pregnancy for nine months. And, and you, know, you know, pregnancies are not a, a trivial thing. It's, uh, 
they can be uh, very difficult and very uh, uh, demanding and stressful on your body. So you know, it's I could never imagine that uh, the idea that a man should be able to tell a woman that since it's his child too, uh, that he should be able to force her to go through with that pregnancy. Uh, and just I don't think anyone can ever have their bodily autonomy violated like that. Uh, and it's a little more complicated when the uh, man just doesn't want to have anything to do with the child. Uh, maybe let's not get into that one either today. <laughs> um, have you heard the argument that by having by allowing legalized abortion, it, it uh, leads to essentially ethnic cleansing? So the the argument goes that um, abortions typically happen among minorities, among poor people. And that type of thing, and it's and it's essentially used like doctors will say, you should have an abortion because you can't take care of this child, and that it is a form of, of essentially of ethnic cleansing. Yeah, that's like a really pernicious argument that pops up once in a while. Uh, people will make the argument that a group like Planned Parenthood is you know horribly racist because uh, you know a larger percentage of their patients happen to come from, you know, like you said, minority backgrounds. Um, but I, I think that argument would only make sense if they were going out and seeking their patients. But that's just not how abortion providers work. They're just there to provide a service to anyone who wants to come and take advantage of that service. So, I mean, really the question is, you know, if it's true that more minorities seek abortions, and I think that is true, factually. Uh, the question is why, why is that occurring? And I think it's uh, you know, a complicated question, but it probably involves things like having a lack of access to birth control. So if we want to prevent that uh, you know, ethnic disparity from occurring, we should take more actions to try and provide more contraception. That would be a reasonable solution to the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when different states have to draft their penal codes, they distinguish between um, unjustified abortion and murder by essentially creating a legislative definition of human life, right? So say like in some states, like human life is only human when it takes its first breath out of the womb. And so do you think in terms of the way our laws work, do you think that is a distinction that is necessary to be made? And Yes, how should that be made and who should make that decision? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to stay on top of all of the legislation that's coming out, especially in the past few years. So uh, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on that type of question. So I think I would just have to defer to organizations which uh, are doing a better job than I am at following all the relevant laws. So I don't really have a good answer to that. And the um, okay, suppose that okay, if we're gonna suppose like there's no real moral difference um, that happens in uh, in a child just by passing through a birth canal, like what's to say that we cannot like destroy babies that are already born? Like let's just say like a baby is like, really just mangled when it comes out and like no one wants it. Uh, is it like is it um, you know okay to like destroy that baby? Okay, that's an interesting yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's actually, you know, it reminds me of the, the arguments that come from another moral philosopher. So if you've ever read Peter Singer's ideas about this issue, uh, he has sort of a, an extreme position, which, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for him, you should go and read his arguments, but essentially, uh, he is in favor of in, uh, allowing infanticide under certain circumstances. And uh, his reasoning for that is based on the idea that, you know, human personhood, you know, the, in the most relevant sense, only begins when there is this, you know, certain level of sentience and, you know, human consciousness that has been achieved. So, you know, I think he's, you know, he's thinking in a logically consistent way, but personally, I don't think uh, that he's doing any favors to the pro-choice movement when he makes those kinds of arguments. 
And you know, in the chart that I drew, the you know my little logarithmic graph of increasing moral worth. You know, personally, the way I would draw that chart is that you're pretty much at 100% moral value, like at the very end of pregnancy. So once you're born, you're already at maximum levels of of human personhood, and your moral worth doesn't continue anymore after that point, in my opinion. But obviously, there's there can be disagreement about the way you should draw that graph. Let's talk later. I assume you referenced a lot in your presentation the idea of personhood as being the thing that's supposed to define moral status for us. Uh, but I guess I question how much we should really like stick to that stick to that notion. I mean, so it seemed intuitive to me that if we came across some advanced alien race that displayed some level of consciousness or rationality that's similar to us, we ought to owe them some level of moral status, even though they're not human. So, given that fact, what do you think are the real reasons why we value personhood as being a, a useful heuristic, I guess, for moral status? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So, uh, when I talk about personhood, uh, the relevant things, like, you know, the relevant changes that are really going on uh, do include the sorts of things which could also apply to aliens. So, like, having a sufficiently complex and developed, you know, brain, uh, that's uh, something that we can assign a lot of value to. Like, the human brain is, like, the most complicated thing in the universe that we know of. So if we encountered an alien species that had similarly complex reasoning abilities, we would certainly grant them the same sorts of moral considerations that we give ourselves. And, and you know, that's the same reason why we can argue um, in terms of having a lot of respect for things like dolphins and primates because they're also <coughs> approaching that same level of sentience and consciousness and uh, uh, moral value that comes from comes from the brain is really the most relevant thing, I think, to the debate. So I think there's something that, can I do like a follow-up? Because I think there's a thought experiment to write that I expected you to answer that way. Because I think it's the most reasonable answer, but it leads us to something, that I guess, that's a little unintuitive. So take a person who's not unconscious. It seems in that moment they don't have any capacities of consciousness, rationality, any of the things that we do find really like is valuable. They can't feel pain or anything. Um, but it still seems that we want to say that the person has moral status, and it seems if we want to say that it has to be either because they had that thing, had those capacities in the past, or because they will have those capacities in the future. Can't we say about an embryo that it will have those capacities in the future, and so therefore it's just the potentiality of this, of the capacities for moral status that is in itself moral status as well. Yeah, that's a really good thought experiment also. Um, yeah, so if, I, I think that's also a, a common pro-life argument, actually. Like, the idea that if consciousness is, only, is the only relevant thing, then when you go to sleep at night, are you suddenly not a person anymore because you're not consciousness? You don't have consciousness anymore? And I think, you know, you answered the question a little bit yourself, which was that it's more about uh, having the ability in the future to return to that state of consciousness. But uh, I think the relevant difference there between uh, something like an embryo and a, a human who is sleeping is that uh, you know, an embryo has the potential to develop into something which could then have consciousness. Uh, a human brain already has that level of complexity already, and even if it's not currently being activated, it's still already there at that, you know, that level of development. Uh, I'll have to think about that one more, though. That's a good question. Uh, how about we take one more, and then we'll, we'll be out of time. Uh, right there. So, my concern with um, making abortions more available to people is like having it take over for contraception. Have you thought about that, or like, what your stance is on that? I don't know if it would happen, no one knows, but is it possible that people would just stop buying condoms and just get an abortion when they got pregnant? Uh, so yeah, that's a fair question. Uh, that's why my solution to the abortion debate is more, in, you know, increased access to contraception. I think that's uh, a solution that everyone should be able to agree upon. But I think that if you would ask that sort of question to anyone who has gone through an abortion, they would tell you how much of a, a trying and difficult and 
uh, sometimes, you know, unfortunate experience that can be. So it, given the choice, if people have the option to utilize contraception, I think they will always go for that option rather than using a, a abortion as a, a method for contraception. Uh, that seems just pretty logically clear that that would be an easier thing for them to do.